Mostly I'm sort of tired today, so don't hold me against me that I'm not memorizing my presentation. I already did a recording earlier today, but the Lord has asked me to continue on. You see, I've talked to two churches officially today, one from going to both in a matter of two weeks span. And each time a pastor insists that they're going to help. They're going to do something to help me put life together, but they only want to offer food, and I have to look at that and go, okay, great. I literally don't have any food right now, so if you're going to offer me food, all I really need is $1. One dollar will provide me a sandwich, meal at McDonald's, and I can literally get the protein that my body needs in order to have enough energy to walk the distance I need to walk from one city now to another city that's much further away, much longer distance for me to travel with my aching legs, and literally get there by morning so that when I get there in the morning, I can literally put myself together with my bags that I'd love to leave somewhere, but literally get on a bus and ride myself downtown Indianapolis in the hopes that my one-day pass will work. I told the man I had no money to procure a ride, and he didn't hear me. You see, men do not listen to issues. They don't listen to anything other than personal pride. I've seen that and experienced that with many pastors that are men, that not only do they have this idea that a pastor has to have pride in every situation, has to be honored by the Lord's house in every single situation, that they don't literally understand that the Lord is never honored when they put their pride into something. You see, the one man commandeered my time in the morning, so I couldn't talk to anyone in the church on my own accord, my own desire to meet people and socialize. He commandeered all my time before the service, and then I literally had to go in and sit with him, which was okay, but I felt a little manhandled. I would have liked to have been able to stand and sing without worrying about whether or not I smelled or whether or not I sang in tune or not or in pitch or anything in old hymns that I know well from the many years of being in that particular faith as a child. And openly the music was lovely and I didn't quite get the full sermon because I drank too much tea, which is true, and I had to sort of miss some of it, but I got the main general gist. I was then pushed into a service for elderly people instead of people my own age demographic, which didn't allow me to meet any men my own age or any women my own age, and that was okay to a point because people appreciated my commentary and I got to hear how bad the presenter was, and that's okay. People don't learn to teach unless they actually teach or they prepare with a teacher who teaches them how to teach and how to put together a lesson and how to manage time so that you don't talk too long and don't piss people off or in the audience. And he managed to piss off just about everybody in the audience, but they were too polite to say it because they were too old, not at all because it's not appropriate in their age demographic to grapple over someone publicly. But men do that when they feel threatened by other people. I've experienced it many times when I ask tough questions. As a journalist, as a man who's interested in faith, as a person who's interested in God, it's not the same. Now, if I have an itch, I itch it. If I have a scratch, I scratch it, and that's where I am right now in my life. If you want to see who I was before all this happened to me, go check some old videos. But openly, someone will have modified them by now. They will have edited them. They will have destroyed my intellectual property rights, and nobody really cares. There seems to be no police of the land looking into these things, and no politicians holding these tele telecommunications and technology companies accountable. We need that today. Now, the other man, I had seen his church two weeks ago, and it was a lovely experience. Nobody interfered with me. Nobody interfered with my rights to worship. It was a good presentation, except there wasn't as much talk on Jesus as there could have been in that sort of presentation in that particular part of the Bible. And that's okay. It's a youthful pastor who's trying to grow a church. And openly, you have to make people want to come. And you have to give them enough detail that they want to come and they long to come. But that's what marketing people do. We figure out who the soul of someone is and we figure out how to produce them. The challenge is that the man that's in photograph on the website is not the man that I've met and not the man I seem to be talking to on the phone, and that makes me leery. It makes me have trust issues. It also puts me leery in what I asked. This man offered me a hotel room, but it was then reason, and he also offered me a meal or a Walmart gift card, which was kind of an odd offering, but it was okay. I'm not anywhere near Walmart or where I am, but he thought that was the right thing to do. And I'm like, you know, a McDonald's gift card for $5 would be just fine. <laughs> then I might be able to eat, even though I'm not crazy about all the french fries I've been eating lately. It sort of produces some fat on my bones, but it's not really the starch that gets me to sleep. It's the protein that I need for energy. And I literally would be able to order an apple pie or, excuse me, something else. You see, I'm already tired, and I only slept a few hours last night because it was frigid cold. 
But the man then proceeded to tell me that he was in a rush. He was in a hurry to get off the phone because he was going to a men's meeting, which I presume was over supper based on the hour or a little bit after supper where there probably would have been something. But the reality is that he promised me a meal, he promised me a hotel, and then he took it all away because he wasn't willing to go on the fact that other pastors have done this and didn't need all that stuff. They just said, we're going to produce a hotel room for you. It's in our name. There you go. Here's the keys. See you later. And yet he wasn't willing to do that out of his own distrust for the world and the Lord in me. So once again, I faced another cold night with no blanket because police or someone else monstrous stole it from my storage unit when I put things in there. And openly, I have no drop cloth to put down on the ground or on a seat where I might need it to stay warm from the frigidness of metal in the freezing cold temperatures. Now maybe the Lord will produce a warmer night. That would be great. But in the meantime, I'm literally out in the cold. And I could have met men who might have been helping me to get someplace tomorrow morning. But you see, people don't understand homelessness. They don't understand that a homeless person is not just afflicted with whether or not they're going to eat. We are practically afflicted with all the challenges that leads us to homelessness meaning the lack of employment, the lack of network, the lack of social opportunities and obligations, the lack of people saying, you know, we're going to love you through this challenge. We're going to help you move forward. We're going to reach out to our entire parish and find out who's got a job. But even for, it's for a few hours, it gives you a little cash in your pocket. Nobody thinks about the liquidation of people's assets or their property that could also produce cash. They could throw together a quick on-the-fly rummage sale on a Sunday. And say, simply, we've got a guy who's lost his home. He's got a few things in the back that he's trying to sell. If anything of interest to you that you might re reproduce for yourself or that you might pick up for an upcoming gift for someone or that you just might like to do to support him, even if you give it over to Goodwill when you're done, that's on you. But openly, we could do that for people. But no one thinks about that. And he literally was going to a men's fellowship where I could have met other men in the church and gotten better acquainted and better welcomed in the church. And he told me that I was always welcome in the church, but when I told him the realities of my struggles and what's going on for me, he literally was sort of like going, come to the service anytime. And that was the extent of his help to a homeless person. You see, I get faith and fellowship every day from the Lord and the Holy Spirit. I don't really have to go to church is absolutely true, but I like to go to church. I like to worship. I like to stand and sing when I have the energy. And openly, I have to have practical relationships that are not controlled by someone else's meanness in order to go on in life. You see, when one man decides that he is the responsible party for all other souls, he's really taking away the Lord's rights in their life. He's also moving people into a position of subliminalness, if you will, or submissiveness to him as opposed to to the Lord. You see, the appropriate response would have been, let me come and give you a few dollars so you can get a meal. I'll be a little late to my men's group. Or, would you like to join me at my men's group where you might be able to meet some people who might be able to help you with your ride situation tomorrow? Surely there'd be one person of 12 that'd be willing to help produce a ride of 15 minutes without a fear of anything ugly happening. You see, in life we have moments of time to help someone, and this pastor now has failed thrice. I were there several weeks back, and they failed. They failed to welcome me into worship or invite me to worship. And openly, they've got the wrong people in the welcome wagon, as really felt was true. But he thinks everything's perfect there, which is literally why he's struggling. He said they're on a modest budget, and he was surprised that mega churches couldn't help. And the truth is, they don't. They all promise one thing food. Nobody gives us shelter because there's no shelters to be had. It's not true that people aren't willing to take a risk. They aren't willing to have their cell phone ready at the, at the ready for a real situation if it really becomes ugly. But most of the time, people like me just want a place to sleep, to sit down, to use the internet, and to go on in life. We're not trying to create difficulty for any other families. We're not trying to get handouts. We're trying to move ourselves forward. In life, there's moments of time to prove who you are. And I reached out some of the largest names right now in the Puddle scheme, and not one of them in their social media people has reduced me, my life, to anything valuable in terms of they take my ideas, they implement them, they get some more success, but they're not implementing them fully is pretty obvious. But my point is that they're not saying, hey, thanks. No one's responding to my tweets. It's like I'm being manipulated to believe that I have a network, but I don't really have one. The one person that I love more than life itself has never responded to my life. Is pretty true. Or someone is deleting her responses and I would never know. In life, we have a moment of time to show people who we really are. 
The Lord is always watching, which was my point to my mother. And openly, when people don't listen to God, they lose out on crowns in heaven. Thanks for listening.